Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. Joining us now for political analysis is Washington Post columnist Ruth Marcus, Ron Fournier of the National Journal, Ben Dominich is the publisher of The Federalist, and The Washington Post's Robert Costa. All right, Mr. Costa, what's, what's Paul Ryan going to do? Paul Ryan, he's interested in doing it. He's moved from no to maybe to possibly yes. I've been on the phone with people who've spoken to him this weekend. He, they believe he has his family's support. And he believes he can actually craft policy from the speaker's chair, which is something he's had to move to in his personal decision making. His main concern is the Freedom Caucus. Do, does Mulvaney, do all these conservatives, do they come with him? Does he have to have some kind of deal? At this point, he has not reached out to them to try to cut a deal. He wants them to come to him. Because he doesn't want that embarrassing moment on the floor of the House where they have the vote and he doesn't get it or he barely gets it. Ben, uh, Paul Ryan has had conflicts with this ultra-conservative movement before on various budget issues. Sure. How is this a solution? Well, I think that this is a little bit of a different situation. I mean, let us all say a word of, of uh, you know, mourning for the passing of, of uh, Kevin McCarthy's political career. Obviously, he's someone, though, who had a long uh, career of misjudging uh, the whip count when it came to various votes. Dave Weigel, your colleague at the Washington Post, had a long litany of instances where he did not assess accurately the number of, of supporters he had for various measures. And I actually think the great irony of this situation is that the last whip count he got wrong may have been the one for himself. I think in this situation, had he pressed the issue, he might still have ended up with the speakership. Paul Ryan's situation now, though, is one where I think he is going to be able to meet uh, the Freedom Caucus to a certain degree to achieve a level of compromise with them because their priorities, as uh, Congressman Mulvaney was making clear earlier on the show, uh, are really more about the internal functioning of Congress and reform of the way that the institution acts, the way that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the chairman of various committees work as opposed to an ideological issue where he would have to find compromise. I think this is a unique moment for Ryan and I actually think ultimately he will take it. But Ron, isn't the debate sometimes these technical, what, what one side says are technological issues or tactical issues get raised to the level of ideology and if you don't follow a tactic that the, the Freedom Caucus wants, then you're not a real conservative. That's the thing. Yeah, sure, he could be speaker, but why in the world would you want to be House Speaker right now? Why would you want to lead a party, lead a caucus that, that doesn't want to be led right now? Why do you want to deal with a base that is, you know, everything's about hell no and we don't like government right now? It might make more sense for a guy like Paul Ryan to kind of let the House burn down, let the Republican Party burn down, let there be great disruption. Why be the caretaker of the status quo, of a broken status quo, when maybe you can be the guy a cycle or two from now who helps the party come back it's from the It's not even the caretaker. It's more like the kindergarten cop. Exactly. And uh, I think that th what we're going to see play out over the next several days is a kind of question of power struggle and who goes first. Congressman Mulvaney was here talking about how the Freedom Caucus wants uh, some assurances and convincing from Paul Ryan about what he is willing to do for them and how strong he will be for them. I don't think that's Paul Ryan's play. His play is, I am the reluctant speaker. If you guys really desperately want me to be speaker, which by the way, they should because the alternatives are not very evident for them, I am not going to go hat in hand to you. You're going to come to me and I'm not going to give you these assurances but you're looking just for. Just to follow up on Ron's point though, so it, it, you're right. It's an unmanageable conference in many ways. But I've, I can report that Ryan's Priebus, the chairman of the party, has come to Ryan personally over the last few days and said, you have to do this for the party. Speaker Boehner has come to him and said, you have to do this for the party. The party's in such a crisis. Ryan doesn't want the job. He may not be able to cut a, a favorable deal with the Freedom Caucus, but the GOP at this fractured moment needs him. But I, this, agree, I agree with all, that, but, uh, all of that, but Ryan's Priebus isn't the party. Yeah. The, the, He's uh, the uh, McCart No, no, they're not the party. The party is, are the people out in the states right now who think... Right. That the, the government is totally obnoxious. And Ryan's you think we should do anything? We should, we have the, the we should blow away but the debt is, limit? But this is why, and, and this, is why it's not, this is why it's not as much of a damage, I think, to the party to have this leadership uh, crisis at this moment. They have not, it, when, when uh, Congress is as unpopular as it is, when its leadership is as unpopular as it is, what does it mean to be in array as opposed to disarray? This is a moment, I think, of upheaval because of these kinds of frustrations that have been coming up from the bottom for a long time. Ryan offers the opportunity for Republicans to have the next leadership 
should be about something more than just small ball moving things forward in let a me, traditional Washington way. Let me move on to presidential politics. Uh, presidential politics and what we've just been discussing has people interested in our new CBS poll. 71% of registered voters think this is an interesting campaign and more people are paying attention now than at this point in the campaign in the last two presidential cycles. Ruth, is that all Donald Trump's? Ratings are good. It's all about <laughs> the ratings. He's good for Donald the ratings. Yeah, but people are interested. People are interested and they should be interested because it's very important for the future of the country. Um, whether they're getting to the right results with their interest is something um, else to answer. I mean, I think that if you look, especially on the Republican side, at a few things that are very striking in this poll. First of all, Donald Trump's resilience. People like me keep telling themselves he's going to fade, he's going away. I saw these numbers going down. Not going to happen, <laughs> um, or at least not happening anytime soon. The second thing that's really striking is Carson's incredible popularity, not just where he is in the polls at 20%, but as a second choice for a lot of people, including these Trump supporters. He is another uh, astonishing phenomenon that undergirds this number from Republican voters that's incredible. 50-something percent want somebody with experience in the private sector. Just 12 percent of these Republican voters want somebody with government or political experience. It's bigger than the Republican Party. You ask why people are so interested in this, because most Americans don't fit neatly into either party. Most Americans hate what, the way the political system is now, ends justify the means, negative partisanship. They're looking for disrupt, disruption. They're looking for a major upheaval. And they just love the idea of watching this reality TV star just really sc screw up the Republican Party. And boy, I don't, I don't think they have a bad, uh, I think they're enjoying watching what Hillary Clinton is going through in a so socialist Democrat and having her on the run. It's fun to watch that these guys they hate squirm. Well, Robert, <laughs> yeah, the reality TV star to whom Ron was referring, uh, uh, Donald Trump, is he coming? You, you talked to him this week. Um, is he moving into a second phase of becoming a different kind of candidate than the reality TV star who's just having a good moment? We sat down with him for an hour, my colleagues Phil Rucker and Dan Balls and I, and we said, you had an amazing summer politically, what's next? He said he has been reluctant to spend money on television ads. He has now hired a Florida-based firm to produce ads. He says they're going to be unconventional. We'll see. He also has committed to spend $20 million plus. That's going to be a test. How much money is Trump really willing to put into his campaign to sustain this momentum, go into January, February, and have that grassroots organization and the battle on the airwaves? Can I just say how good Donald Trump is as a politician? <laughs> when you can go into an interview with, with Bob Costas, uh, 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 Dan Balls, and Phil Rucker. Rucker. I'm sorry, Phil yeah. Rucker. Um, the Pope couldn't do an interview with those three people and have a relatively positive story. <laughs> I don't think yet that Trump is going for the papal seat, but we may. <laughs> ben, let me ask you about Jeb Bush. Mm -hmm. our, the findings are not good in our poll. Let's, let's walk through some of them quickly. His favorability rating among Republicans has dropped 11 points since August. He now has the highest unfavorable rating among Republicans, even higher than Donald Trump. And only 10% of Republican primary voters think that he has the best chance of winning in the general election. Now, among all voters, only 20% view him favorably. Can Jeb Bush recoup? Where, what's the state of the Jeb Bush? You know, I, I think that Jeb is definitely someone who built a campaign on the mindset of winning in February and March. I think that that's still his aim. I think that though we've seen certainly a number of candidates uh, come to this point and have problems with the level of campaign expenditures that they have in terms of the operation that they've built. I think that Jeb Bush is challenged in a, in a certain way by having that sort of scenario. You compare that to the experience of someone like Ben Carson, who is raising a ton of money, doesn't have a significant burn rate. Uh, you compare that to someone like Ted Cruz, who is also raising a significant amount of money. And you see campaigns that might actually be able uh, to be more competitive than we might have anticipated because of that. Jeb does have a real challenge to uh, really uh, turn around these numbers within Republican voters. I'm not sure he has an easy uh, path to do so, and it's going to be a real test for him because he has to defend not just his own record, uh, but his brother's, which is a real challenge with the current to take the other, voters. To take the other side of my question, we've seen people declare the death of John Kerry, John McCain, Mitt Romney, they all got the nomination. So, but because because if you really if you Trump Donald Trump has attention fever everybody else well the other kind of traditional candidates in the field have presidential fever so they will be willing to slog it out and slog it out go through humiliating moments in a campaign and firehouses in New Hampshire where there's 20 people there because in the end what it matters what happens on primary night and not what happens before that 
But I want to take the moment to say something about Ben Carson and your remarkable interview with Please Ben do. Carson, because you were talking to him about guns, and he said, if we have a time when we have the wrong person uh, in office and they want to dominate the people, the people would be able to defend themselves. I would like to say that the solution in America when we have the wrong people in office is called elections. We have a democracy. I thought you were pressing him and appropriately so. I thought Ben Carson is a fascinating candidate because his demeanor is, seems so reasonable. He's a physician. We respect but that. What comes out of his mouth? Let me just finish. Let me wait, wait, wait. But what comes out of his mouth about guns and about other things is remarkably radical. Sam Adams talked about the ability of Americans to defend themselves when their when their government was dominated by vain and aspiring men. How is that any different? The well, difference is right now we have a whole Republican Party that is spending a lot of money and a lot of time convincing the American public that, that this government is dominating them. So what he's basically doing is putting a target. But is this government, government taking officials. their guns? And I think that's, that's irresponsible that's, of a presidential candidate. I don't think that's irresponsible at all. If this government really was to rise up and say that they were going to every household in America and take their guns away, you don't think that that's an opportunity well, that's not for what the government said. is doing. That's that's not what he said. That's not what he said. But he does, but he does say the government is, is dominating us, and then in the next breath he says that we should be able I to... I do not think me, that is a call for armed insurrection. I, I do think the establishment is... A, in, in, I don't know if it's this cycle or if it's next cycle or the cycle after that. The establishment in both parties is about to get kicked in the teeth. The question is, what is the right candidate to do that? Is it somebody who's aspirational, can lead us to a new and a better century? Or is it somebody who's negative and makes these kind of, I think, veiled threats that Ben Carson did? Let me... Let me uh, Robert, let me ask you a question about honesty and uh, trustworthiness, which I talked to Donald Trump about. In our poll, we have, among the voters, when you look at the candidate numbers, this is among the general election, uh, the two candidates leading their parties, uh, that is to say, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, their numbers are very bad on the honest and trustworthy. Only 35% say Hillary Clinton is honest and trustworthy. Only 33% say Trump is honest and trustworthy. Those who say, and there's not much there are not many people who don't have a view on this. <laughs> what does this tell us, if anything, about our politics now, that the two people leading the parties are not seen as honest and trustworthy? It, it's, a, it's a problem for them, perhaps, in a general election, and I've spoken with both campaigns about this, but they still believe on the Trump side he has the groundswell of support. On the right, they see him as a tough leader in the GOP base. They think that it's better than being seen as trustworthy. And with Secretary Clinton, regardless of her, her problems with the email, she believes with the base Democratic voters, they're going to stick with her, historic candidate. They believe she's a, a real leader coming out of the Obama administration. They think she'll survive that. Ruth, speaking of honest and trustworthy and Secretary Clinton, she changed her position essentially on trade with this Trans-Pacific Partnership. What do you make of that decision? Uh, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> what I make is, um, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how she answers questions about that at the debate coming up. I mean, by, it, by the way, 70% of the Democratic primary voters find her to be honest and trustworthy. That's the number she has to worry about right now. Look, everybody who has paid attention to Hillary Clinton knows where she really is on trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Which she is to said say the opposite was, of what she's now articulated. She said it <laughs> was the gold standard. Yes. She now says that she can't support it, and she has identified two reasons, Cur failures on currency manipulation and being too kind to pharmaceutical companies. When she said it was the gold standard, it was less good on both of those things than it is now. So, uh, you know, in, in law, they teach you to, um, when you're cross-examining somebody, to say, which time were you lying for Hillary Clinton uh, at the debate? The question is, which time were you being disingenuous? This, let me talk a little bit about, about emails, if I could, which is her untrustworthy problem. And, and, and the Democrats are pointing at Republicans and McCarthy saying, we just want to bring her down as, as mitigating for her. We have two sets of facts. One is, uh, we know that the Republican Party did everything they could to destroy Hillary Clinton with Benghazi, a hyper-partisan Republican Party. And they caught Hillary Clinton red-handed, creating a I improper covert server that undermined the Freedom of Information Act, that subverted uh, uh, legislative oversight, and jeopardized U.S. secrets. Both of those things can be true. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, both of those things are true. But the re Democrats try to use the one thing to mitigate them, and the Republicans try to use the other to, to, to mitigate them. And meanwhile, 
both parties think that the, most Hillary, voters think that that the leaders of the parties are lying to them because, because they are. Hillary, Hillary Clinton is lying about this. She frequently lies about this. Her words are the cake she gives the people to eat. Okay, and they do eat it up. This is the situation that is entirely about current politics, and it has no reflection on what she would actually do as president. This is the trade uh, yes, position absolutely. you're talking about. And, and the unions, she's feeling heat from the unions. I mean, the Bernie Sanders is really connecting with labor, and that's why you see Secretary Clinton navigating. Mm. All right, everyone thinks it's a purely political decision at the roundtable, apparently. We'll be right back to talk about news overseas. This portion of Face the Nation is sponsored by Audi. Challenge all givens. Yesterday, two suicide bombers launched attacks in Ankara, Turkey. The death toll now stands at at least 97, with close to 250 injured. CBS News foreign correspondent Holly Williams is in Istanbul this morning. Holly, what can you tell us about the attack? Good morning, John. The target of this attack was a peace rally being held in the heart of Ankara, the Turkish capital. Suspected suicide bombers set off two explosions within seconds of each other, and the aftermath was horrific. Body parts scattered on a city street, uh, desperate attempts to resuscitate those hit by the blast and people searching frantically for their loved ones. Now, the peace rally was organised following an upsurge in violence between the Turkish state and militants from the country's Kurdish minority. The Turkish Prime Minister uh, Ahmet Davutoglu said last night that both Kurdish militants and ISIS are potential suspects in yesterday's bombing. But some here in Turkey hold the government responsible for the attack. And today scuffles broke out with police as thousands of mourners gathered in Ankara and Kurdish politicians tried to lay flowers at the scene of the deadly explosions. This comes just three weeks before Turkey is due to hold national elections in which Kurdish voters and the main Kurdish party uh, could play a decisive role in the outcome. But Turkish democracy is fragile and now looks shakier than ever. John. Holly Williams for us in Istanbul, Turkey. Thanks, Holly. We are joined now by former Obama National Security Advisor Tom Donlan and Washington Post columnist David Ignatius. David. What's your, what's your reaction to what happened in Turkey? Uh, the, the first thing to say is, is that watching that video of the bomb going off as the demonstrators are dancing uh, is just, it's just horrifying. It's haunting. The, the Obama, uh, Obama administration's initial uh, uh, sense is that it's too early to assign blame. The Turkish government believes this is the work of ISIS, uh, uh, has not publicly said that, but that's, that's their belief. ISIS was responsible for the last big bombing in Turkey in July, uh, which killed 33 people. The one thing you can say about this is whoever did it was trying to deepen the wedge between the ruling AK party of President Erdogan and the Kurdish activists uh, who are part of uh, Turkish politics, but are also key U.S. allies in the fight against ISIS inside Syria and Iraq. So, you know, th this was an attempt to, to create division, uh, and it, it may well do just that. Yeah. What are the repercussions, yeah. do you think, Tom? Well, I think, I think that we've now, this is the next nation in the region under great pressure right now. I think it's a, uh, we're ending into a period of significant instability for Turkey. It comes from a lot of different sources uh, coming at the same time. Uh, there's a renewed battle going on between uh, the Turkish government and Kurdish separatist forces. We had a peace process for a while that's fallen apart. There's a real direct challenge from ISIS now, after Turkey's now entered into the fight against ISIS. There's real political instability in the, in the country right now and division leading up to these elections in November. Erdogan lost his majority uh, last June and called snap elections in November. There's an economic, economic slowdown and there, the UN has registered 1.9 million refugees from Syria. So. Uh, President Erdogan has, has his work cut out for him, uh, and I think the, the, the country's under significant pressure. Let me ask you about Syria. The, the train and equip program from this yeah. administration has, is basically now over. It's judged to be a failure. Uh, what happened? Well, I think, I think we need to look very hard at what happened, and I think that the, that the policy needs a refocus and, and needs to be re-energized across a number of dimensions. But this capacity building issue is a broader issue uh, for the United States. How do we provide the help to countries to be able to do these, do these projects on their own. Uh, and this was obviously a serious, a serious failure. Re-energize and refocus, though, I think we, we, need, we need to put together a serious campaign in the north against the ISIS so-called capital of Raqqa. I think we need to look at the safe haven issue. We need a re-energized uh, and more effective air campaign. 
need to cut off financing. There are a lot of things that need to have happened here, but this is a serious failure. David, is this a failure that could have been foreseen? Training and equipping didn't work exactly very well in Iraq in, in some ways. In certain, uh, Also, uh, if it had been started earlier when somebody like Secretary Clinton had pushed for it, would that have made more sense? What do you make of this? I, I think the administration has, has got to face up to the reality that this is an intelligence and policy formulation disaster. This has been coming at us in slow motion since ISIS broke out in Iraq. That was over a year ago. Our Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, said the administration underestimated the threat posed by these people. A year later, they rolled through Ramadi in Iraq. Same thing, underestimated. We've had a program to train and equip Syrian rebels that ended up being a catastrophe. Why didn't we see that coming? So President Obama this week hit the reset button. Okay, we're going to stop doing the things that don't work. We're going to try to do more of the things that do work. Okay, fine. But you do need to look at why these mistakes kept happening the last two and three years before you're going to be able to get the policy right. And that's what I hope the White House will face up to. Why is this going wrong? Another apparent policy, or excuse me, intelligence failure, is that the Russians are now much more heavily involved in Syria than, I mean, was it a policy failure? I'm sorry, I should ask it as a, 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 an intelligence failure that, we, that the U.S. missed that the Russians would be actively militarily engaged in Syria. I don't know Syria. if it's an intelligence failure. I do think Russian intentions are quite clear, though. Yeah. Uh, and the Russian intention in, in Syria is to prop up the Assad regime, uh, to put Russia in a, in a place to uh, be, able, be able to be a dominant force, with respect to whatever political settlement emerges here. This is not Russia joining some anti-ISIS coalition, anti-terror coalition. This is all about Russian interests. Which and is what they say it is out yeah. loud, and, right? And it's just, but look at the geography of the strikes yeah. and look at the weaponry. The geography is against almost all, not ISIS targets, but opposition to Assad. And the weaponry has a lot more to do with kind of precluding Western, uh, Western options. Now, the Russians may live to regret this, uh, but it is a more complicated and a more dangerous situation. You have U.S. and Russian military assets operating in military campaigns in very close proximity. That's exceedingly dangerous. And I think we'll see, you know, Russian approach to these kinds of things is not, is not uh, subtle. If you look at what their approach was, David will remember this very clearly in Chechnya, for example, I think that's to give you a picture of what you could see in terms of Russian effort here. David, do you, what, do, what do you make two questions on intelligence, but then also uh, President Obama said, well, this is a sign of weakness for Vladimir Putin. His economy has collapsed. He's got to prop up his one state in the region. What do you make of that argument? First, I, I think the intelligence uh, was a problem. We didn't see the dimensions of the Russian military intervention in, in, in Syria coming. The president does see this as a sign of Putin's weakness. Mm -hmm. And, and it's true that Putin is playing a weak hand. His key client, uh, Bashar al-Assad, is, is just hanging by a thread. And that is the major reason I think the Russians have come in. What the administration has to see is that Putin now in Syria, as in, in Ukraine, is playing a weak hand brilliantly, forcefully. And this is, to me, an illustration. As the U.S. steps back in these areas of conflict, others step forward. And they, they begin to do things. They begin to create facts on the ground, as Russia is now doing with, with its military, that change the situation for us. So, yes, Putin is, is weak, as the president says, but the U.S. response, I would say, is weaker right, still. Dan, I've got to interrupt you. I'm sorry. We're out of time. Tom, thanks so much. Thank you both. We'll be back in a moment. Be sure to tune in tonight to 60 Minutes and Steve Croft's interview with President Obama. That's tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern or right after football. That's all the time we have for today. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.